One of the points that Hillary made, I just want to expand on very slightly at the start, and that was this extraordinary experience in Bradford on the 28th of August last year, when the English Defence League came with the stated intention of causing a riot. And they were very clear about this, uh, and the city worked incredibly hard. My colleagues in the programme for the Peaceful City, Lisa Cumming, uh, Walida Shafi from the local community, Jenny Pierce and others, worked incredibly hard with local friends and others. I was down in the city for the whole of that day. There was very good work by the police working very closely with the local community. And bluntly, Bradford did not rise to the bait. Uh, and I have this vivid vision of driving home to Huddersfield, where I live, along the M62 uh, that evening, and seeing four or five coaches with EDL supporters being escorted by the police out of the county. And essentially, it was an extraordinary development in Bradford. And I might say also, that the police tactics which we used have been passed on to other forces. They're completely different from the kind of tactics the Met have used in recent years. They were much more proactive in an almost a kind of non-violent way. It's extraordinary. And I think it's something which reflects quite well on them. And I think it's lessons which have been learned elsewhere. Um, I was asked if I would to speak around the, the theme of this gathering. And I'll try and limit it to about 30, 35 minutes. Um, if I go on longer, then get riskless. Hillary will tell me to stop anyway, because the most important thing, obviously, is, is the discussion that we have afterwards. Um, Hillary mentioned that Claire and I are grandparents. We have uh, Zoe, who is just over two, and Ben, who is just three months old. Both of those could be living in the 22nd century. They'd be in the late 80s, early 90s. It's perfectly possible. There's a very good chance that they will live through to their 70s and 80s, and so they will be live in the, the last decades of this century. And I sometimes think that if they are to look back over their lives, much of the way their lives as people, part of the world population, uh, will develop will be dependent on what happens, I think, in the next 10 or 15 years. I think there's a very real chance in some ways uh, that people in the future, in 40 or 50 years' time, and some people here will be young enough to still be around then, will look back on one particular century as the pivotal century uh, over mi millennia. And I would label that century not from um, 2000 to 2100, but from 1945 to 2045. Because in that century, uh, we as human beings um, are going through the capacity to destroy ourselves and also the capacity to destroy the global environment. Now, on the first bit, 1945 is obvious, the first explosion of a nuclear weapon, the test, and then Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A level of destructiveness which hugely surpassed even the trench fort warfare uh, and the 30-year war and all the other wars of the previous uh, hundreds of years. It brought in an era in which we could have gone over the precipice into a global nuclear confrontation. We're now, what, some decades beyond that, and one, I think we would have to be honest and say that if we were meeting in this hall or this predecessor 25 years ago, what would have been absolutely to the fore of our minds would be the fear of a nuclear exchange, if you go back to the 1980s. And essentially, we're, we're not out of that. There is still a very big danger, but in a way, it's a change from slipping over to the abyss of utter nuclear destruction and a slippery slope towards proliferation and the problems that that would bring. But we are slowly, I think more by luck than anything else, have escaped from the huge dangers of the Cold War. And we now know just how dangerous those were. Many people here, I'm sure, will have been very much involved in the anti-nuclear campaign in the 70s and 80s and maybe even earlier. And what people were saying then about the dangers have turned out, if anything, not to be exaggerations, but to be the reverse, because we now know how dangerous that was. I must admit just one small thing. Hillary mentioned about the, uh, the fox getting the hens. Through diverse routes, I have a large quantity of the original green and common fence rolled up on the small holding somewhere. And one of these days, I'm going to, I'm going to actually make a fox-proof hen run. It didn't keep people out of green, it might keep the fox out of the hens. I know one shouldn't joke about these things, but I think sometimes a bit of levity helps. And the real point is that we were in an incredibly dangerous era. We're not escaped from it fully, but at least on that issue, it may not be quite the bond that is closest to our throats that we have to first cut loose, as the Irish proverb says. But we're now moving into the second part of that century, 
where what is obvious is that we have the capacity to actually do huge damage to our entire global environment, not necessarily through nuclear war, but by actually destroying that environment. And what I want to explore quite briefly is the kinds of trends that we now face, what they would lead to if we didn't turn it round, and then at least some pointers to how we turn things round towards a more sustainable and emancipated future. Um, I put it this way, I think in some ways there are three big drivers, dangers that we have to watch out for. The first actually isn't about environmental constraints, I'll come on to that in a minute. The first is the way the entire world economy has gone. And to put it very bluntly, the last 30 years of neoliberal based economic growth has not delivered economic justice. It's been extraordinary if you look at the data that almost all, the great majority of all the benefits of the last 30 years, 40 years even, of economic growth have been focused on about one-fifth of the world's population. About one and a half billion, maybe slightly less. And the other four-fifths have basically had what is left. The divide is extraordinary. About 85% of all the world's household income or wealth is in the hands of about one-fifth of the global population. The great majority of us here probably would be in that one-fifth. And the rest are, in a sense, not sharing in that. It doesn't mean that the poor are getting poorer, although the, most, the billion worse off people are probably no better off than 30, 40 years ago. And certainly the time of the world food crisis in 1973-74, there were over 450 million people who were actually malnourished. The figure is now closer to 900 million, in spite of all the efforts of the, of the last 30, 40 years. Now the key point here is that divide is not narrowing. And it is not just narrowly geographical. There may be 80 to 100 million people who will be certainly middle class in their levels of wealth in China, maybe getting near that number in India, some tens of millions in Brazil, and in this other side of the coin, in a country like the United States of 300 million people, maybe 30 to 40 million people would be in that wider margin. And the thing is, the, the system as it works is not rectifying this. In fact, it is making it worse. And that, I think, is a, a dominant issue which we still don't really get to grips with. Now, there is another aspect of that which I think is very important, and that is one of the real success stories of the last 40 years or so has been the huge improvements in education and literacy work worldwide. Hillary mentioned that I, I worked for a couple of years uh, in Uganda at a time, this is just before Idi Amin, which probably dates me a bit, but the point is that at that time, the Uganda government was trying to get more and more kids through at least four years of primary education, uh, basic reading and writing, etc. But it was a minority of kids who were doing it. That's transformed across most of the majority world, where you have much higher levels of basic education, and even the gender gap is slowly but surely narrowing. Now that's a tremendous success. It's been done through the huge efforts of people right across the world. Okay, helped a little bit here by aid schemes and the rest, but essentially people doing it themselves. But the point about that, in, in an era in which you get higher levels of education, literacy, and much improved communications, one of the aspects of that, one of the consequences of that, is people actually become more conscious of their own position and more conscious of their own marginalization. And that does a lot to explain some of the anger and resentment which one does get in many parts of the world. Some of you will remember that sort of phrase of sociologists 30 years ago, the revolution of rising expectations. Economic growth would ensure that people got better off, and in the short term there might be problems, but the future looked bright in material terms. It's now much more a case of a revolution of frustrated expectations. And you see it, for example, classically in the neo-Maoist Naxalite rebellion in India, which comes from the margins. And the Mohan Singh, the Indian Prime Minister, is candid enough to say it's the greatest security threat uh, facing the state of India. Not much covered overseas, but it's an endemic thing affecting more than half of the states within India. And essentially, it is this combination of a widening of the divide and more knowledge on the margins. I'm even hesitant to use the term margins because we're talking about the majority, it's not a minority. That is a situation that we're facing before we come on to the second issue of environmental constraints.
There isn't time to go into any detail on that. We have the problems of different sorts of resources, everything from the dangerous strategic minerals with all the fighting in the Great Lakes region, the extraordinary concentration of oil and gas around the Persian Gulf, over 60% of all the world's oil reserves in and around that one narrow area. But the much more significant thing is, of course, climate change. Um, the small holding that we got just near Huddersfield, it's outside, it's in the East Pennines, we're about 450 feet up. I planted a vineyard about 12 or 13 years ago, and I now produce wine from an open air vineyard each year. Uh, and this is, would have been impossible without climate change. I hasten to say it's not very big, it's probably less than half the size of the lecture theatre. My wife describes it as a vignette rather than a vineyard because of its size. <laughs> but the point is that is an indicator of climate change actually happening. But that really is not the important thing. The important thing, I think, is what has been learned very much in the last 15 to 20 years, and that is that climate change and its impact is asymmetric. It is going to affect different parts of the world in different ways. The near Arctic is very heavily affected. And in fact, we, we had information out quite recently that the January level of Arctic sea ice is the lowest since records were first kept by satellite reconnaissance in 1979 and it's just declining each year. We all know about the opening up of the Arctic later in the year. It's even happening in midwinter. But the much more important thing than that is the expectation that while the oceans will not warm up very much, the tropical and subtropical land masses will, and with that also will be decreases in rainfall. Now let me just say this is on present trends. It doesn't have to be that way. But if we were to proceed down this path, the end result will be a very large part of the world's population having much greater difficulty actually surviving their ordinary way of life, let alone developing. And the implications of that are absolutely massive when you begin to think about it. Again, that is a trend which can be turned around, but it is happening. And it's very clear also that even now, there isn't an increase in extreme weather events, but the extreme weather events tend to be more intense. And there are early indications that that may be linked to climate change. Uh, the wildfires in Russia last year, the extraordinary monsoonal flood in Pakistan, uh, Hurricane Katrina for that matter, and many other examples. Now essentially, it is the combination of the trend towards a divided world, which a constrained one, which is a central issue, in my view, for the second part of that century through to, through to 2045, which brings us to the third issue very quickly, and that is the risk that there is a very strong tendency for the richer, better off, if you like, the broad elites of the world to want to maintain the status quo. And essentially, this is the most dangerous thing, uh, that you get what I call lidism. You keep the lid on things. You go, don't go to the underlying factors. I was very struck, uh, we do work sometimes with defense colleges, they do lecture at defense colleges. What's very interesting is to see some of the stuff coming out from the military think tanks. The Development Concepts and Doctrine Center down at Shrivenham has done a lot of work on global trends. And it actually would give an analysis very similar to this one I've just been sketching, this combination of marginalization and environmental constraints. And they actually write some very good stuff, but from their perspective, as professional military people, their job is to protect this country. So they see it as a security issue, and what they have to do is to maintain a degree of control in what could be a very fragile, uncertain international security dimension. They don't go further and look at it from a much more broad basis of sustainable conflict prevention. And if you manage to see any of the newspapers today, there was the report from the Defense Select Committee about the recent strategic defense and security review, and basically was saying we're not spending enough money to ensure our place in the world by having the military means to use military when we need to. And the real sad thing about that is that a number of groups, including Greenpeace and Oxford Research Group, put in evidence to that committee, which is there, it's already been printed, which just presents a very different view, but it's still largely ignored. And the problem is that you see things in a way in which we're going to get a different kind of dangerous, unconstrained world, and we've got to maintain control. And this isn't that new. You go right back to, what, the mid-90s. I remember quite vividly that when Bill Clinton became president, uh, he appointed as his first director of central intelligence, a CIA director, a man called James Woolsey. And as is the American uh, rule, he was actually interviewed by the Senate committee to confirm his appointment. And one of the senators, senators actually asked Woolsey, 
This is in 1993. How would you compare the Cold War era to what we're now beginning to live in, the post-Cold War era? Uh, Wolsey thought for a minute, he said, I wouldn't look at it this way. We have slain the dragon, Soviet Union, but we now live in a jungle full of poisonous snakes. And essentially the new attitude was keeping the jungle under control, if you like, taming the jungle. And that, I think, is the real risk we face. It's added to by the fact that we lost almost a complete decade on the climate change side, and in many ways on the economic side, uh, through the nature of the Bush administration. Climate change deniers almost to a past person. And we're not really appreciating the full impact of the kinds of economic problems that began in 2008 and are very much continuing. There isn't that kind of work going on yet.